evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us here on the Inside Winston Cup Racing. I'm at the North Carolina Motor Speedway at Rockingham, North Carolina, where the AC Delco 400 comes up on October 22nd. But today, the NASCAR Winston Cup drivers were at the North Wilkesboro Speedway for the running of the Tyson Holly Farms 400. A typical short track race, Jeff Gordon took another step towards winning his first ever NASCAR Winston Cup championship. Randy Pemberton is in our studios in Charlotte, North Carolina, with a post-race report. Good evening, Randy. Good evening, Ned, and hello, everyone. Welcome to the post-race edition of IWCR for Sunday, October 1st. Mark Martin won the Tyson Holly Farms 400 this afternoon. It was also a victory of sorts for Ernie Irvin, who finished sixth in his first race in over a year. We'll have highlights and reaction from Mark, Ernie, and others from North Wilkesboro. Also on tonight's show, an up-close look at Rusty Wallace and the Penske South team, who continue to build consistency in the closing races. And the IWCR crew tackles a pit stop on press day at the North Carolina Motor Speedway. Well, sort of. That and more coming up. Today's show is brought to you by Texaco Havlin Formula 3 Motor Oil. Add more life to your car. Red Dog Beer. Bold yet smooth. Unusually easy to drink. You are your own dog. And by Goodyear. Number one in racing. Number one in tires. Today's Winston Cup highlights are brought to you by Texaco Havlin Formula 3. Add more life to your car. As the chase for the Winston Cup title comes to a close, Jeff Gordon refuses to give ground to Dale Earnhardt. Today, Gordon was third, Earnhardt ninth as the points race appears all but over. Mark Martin picked up his 17th career win on the day his best friend, Ernie Irvin, climbs back behind the wheel. Here are the highlights from the Tyson Holly Farms 400. Ted Musgrave led the first 12 laps of the Holly Farms 400 before Bobby Hamilton pushed his STP Pontiac to the point. But it was Mark Martin out front when this wreck between Jimmy Spencer, Hutt Strickland, and Bobby Labonte brought out the first caution of the afternoon. Mark Martin managed to keep his Valvoline forward at the point until Jeff Gordon got by just before the first round of green flag pit stops began to shake up the standings. Ernie Irvin took the lead after stops. Ernie cruised out front and is Havlin Ford for the next 35 laps. But time at the point was precious. Martin, then Dale Earnhardt, then Dale Jarrett, and Ricky Rudd were all able to make it to the front before the halfway mark. In fact, 19 lead changes among 13 different drivers by halfway. Shortly after halfway, Dale Jarrett was holding off Ricky Rudd until heavy traffic forced Jarrett to go high and Rudd went back to the front in search of his first win of 1995. The race continued clean and green until another round of green flag stops put the pressure on the pit crews once again. With just over 100 laps to go, Rudd, Jarrett, and Earnhardt were the top three. With 80 laps to go, there were still 10 cars on the lead lap, including Jeff Gordon, who wasn't having a great day, but he was sitting a solid eighth and protecting his Winston Cup points lead. Meanwhile, it was then that Dale Earnhardt dropped the cylinder and went out of contention. After the final round of green flag stops, it was Jarrett's race to win. But he nearly lost it in traffic trying to get by Hutt Strickland and Kyle Petty. That allowed Martin to reel in the 28 with Rudd right behind. With less than 50 to go, Darrell Waltrip made an unscheduled pit stop to extend his winless streak to 96. Suddenly on lap 369, Dale Jarrett wrecked to bring out the second and final yellow flag. That set up a sprint to the checkers that would not include Ricky Rudd, who had to pit twice for loose lug nuts. Martin led the field with 25 to go. He was followed by Wallace, Gordon, and Terry Labonte. Martin was never challenged over the final laps, and the outside pole sitter went on to grab his third win of 1995. Rusty was second. Gordon finished third. Happy faces around the world today when Ernie Irvin made his return to Winston Cup Racing after more than a year. Irvin ran well, Mark Martin won, Jeff Gordon protected his points lead over Earnhardt. Here are some post-race thoughts from Mark, Rusty, Ernie, and an upset Ricky Rudd. That was a great run for you. You had a good car today, Mark. Yeah, it was. It was an accident, I'm sure, because we don't run very good here. Usually struggle. Uh, we were so proud last time here we ran fifth, and we were so proud of that. And uh, we just messed around a little bit, and... Uh, Decided to try a couple of things a little bit different, not that much. And that thing was really awesome. Uh, I usually really burn up the rear tires here, so the first half of the race, I babied it along, and I found out I didn't have to. And at that point, we just started motoring toward the front. 
I think uh, Mark's car was kind of like mine. It'd go for a little bit and on a set of tires, it wouldn't go, but uh, he had it all together right there at the end. He did a great job and just flat out run me. And I, I was happy to finish second after a poor qualifying run. Yeah, that's real good for you in the points, too. You came in here in the top five. Well, the car's always been running. You know, I've always told everybody I'm not a real good qualifier. I just try to do the best I can in the race. And that's a third, a third, a first, a third, and a second. So uh, we're pretty consistent. We got Atlanta we're testing at, and we're testing at Phoenix, Arizona. So. Hopefully we can get a couple wins out of these next four races yet to go. I tell you, you know, normally you wouldn't be happy about a sixth place finish, but um, I tell you, this is like um, like winning anyway. You know, uh, it, it's just something that uh, you know to to be able to come back from what we did and and be able to lead the race and, and come back. I mean, this is the toughest uh, sport in the world as far as um, racing, and uh, so it's amazing that uh, we could come back and do this. What about Charlotte next week? We don't know about Charlotte. We're just, uh, you know, it's going to be something that me and Robert and Larry and, and all the, the sponsors have to sit down and figure out what we need to do. Well, Ricky, I know you're disappointed. You had a great car. You drove a great race, and you had great stops today. You had one unfortunate error. Well, I say we finished the race. Had uh, had one lug nut off the left front, and, uh, you know, I've, I've been racing for 20 years, never been called back in. I finished races with two and three lug nuts on before and never been brought back in. And you know, I felt like the race was ours. I was sitting there playing with Mark at the end of the race and uh, letting him go up there and bust the traffic. He was having to work his rear tires a little harder. We are just sitting there waiting for 10 to go, and uh, our car would run very good on new tires also. So we, we felt like we had him covered, and uh, not a whole lot you can do when NASCAR says come back in. You know, can't beat City Hall. Sitting in uh, the gas pumps today, the top five cars go to gas pumps. The five cars sitting there with two lug nuts off and sitting right there looking at it and uh, no penalty. I guess uh, I guess sour grapes on my part because uh, I've never been called back in for one lug nut. Ricky Rudd, very disappointed after the race, felt the tied Ford could have gotten to victory lane. After talking to people in the garage following the Holly Farms 400, there is some question about the consistency of that lug nut call. Can officials make it on every stop, on every car, at every race? Jeff Gordon did what he had to do, protected his lead in the race to the championship, and a page from tomorrow's news, D.K. Ulrich will announce he has sold his interest in the 77 car to a partner that already had a share of the ownership. Randy, back to you. Thanks, Bill. Tough way to lose a race because of loose lug nuts. I'm sure we haven't heard the last of the pit road rules. We'll keep you apprised. We need to take a break. Uh, Ned will join you in a moment as we leave you. Here's the remaining finish order from the Tyson Holly Farms 400. A brand new enclosed garage area is one of the new improvements here at the North Carolina Motor Speedway. Rusty Wallace has had a lot of success on this one mile track and he'll rank among the favorites when we come back here for the AC Delco 400 in a few weeks. Some people might think that Rusty has not had a good year in 1995, but going into the Wilkesboro weekend, he has two victories and ranks fifth in the NASCAR Winston Cup point standings. Randy Pemberton profiles the Miller Genuine Draft team and its driver. Rusty Wallace and his Penske South Racing Team roared into 1995 with high hopes of taking home the prestigious Winston Cup title. Along the way would surely be several showings in the winner's circle. A theme that this team had grown accustomed to after winning a staggering 18 events the previous two years. But by the time the tour got through Atlanta, rumblings of rule changes to help combat an apparent aerodynamic advantage of the new Chevrolet Monte Carlo were running rampant through the garage area. And Rusty was right in the middle of Ford's fight for more downforce. Something many considered the catalyst for Chevy sweeping the first seven races. Ironically, it was Rusty that stopped Chevy's streak at seven when his Ford rolled to victory lane in Martinsville at the end of April. It was 16 races before Rusty and the Brew Crew would celebrate in victory lane again. I can sit here in, in, in both these hands and count up that many races I probably should have won. You can look at the Brickyard 400, a full straightaway lead and had it wrapped up and have a crash on pit road. You can look at Michigan, the first race, when we had a pit for fuel. You can look at Pocono when I had pit for fuel after big leads. You can look at Dover, Delaware after first lap crash there and, and, and come back and get two laps back and have the quickest car. There's so many times that I could have, but I didn't. And during their summer drought, many people outside the Penske organization pointed to new crew chief Robin Pemberton as the reason for the team's failure to find victory lane. But according to Rusty, that's just not the case. I keep telling people, 
and they keep trying to lay this thing off in Robin, and it's really getting it's getting under my skin because Robin is the best guy we've ever had at Penske Racing. Now, I'm not saying that because he's your brother. He just flat ass is. He's really good with the shocks. He's really good with team morale. He's really good with aerodynamics, and he's a wonderful guy. We're both the same age. We drink together. We party together. We race hard together. Reminds me of the days of Barry Dodson and me when we were together. So that's done. We're definitely a better team. I know that. Statistically speaking, it was only a matter of time before this team would probably stumble a little bit, not win all the races, or something would happen. And you know, this happened to be the rule, I, or this happened to be the way it worked out this year. You know, I had, uh, I never had any reservations of coming over here. I knew it was going to be hard. You know, Buddy's got big shoes to fill, but we're two completely different types of people, so we run run things differently. And, uh, you know, I would be upset if I was looking at this as a short-term thing. I mean, this is a long-term thing, not just Penske Racing, but the entire Penske organization, you know. It's, it's a great organization to be in. And, uh, you know, you just, sometimes you just have to take your lumps, you know, and it goes that way. Other than the acquisition of Pemberton, the team has had little turnover over the years. Todd Parrott is still there with Rusty, one of his buddies from the Blue Max days. Todd leads a long list of people who put their heart and soul into their work. The guys back at the shop, Gary Brooks, Bill Wilburn, the guys that stay back and prepare the cars every week, you know, that don't get all the recognition. I and mean, we just bring it to the racetrack. I mean, we took a brand new car to Watkins Glen. I mean, brand spanking new, a car that I never even put a wrench on until we got to the test, unloaded it, and it was just like a second and a half faster than we ran last year. You know, and they set the car up. They did all that. So, you know, they, they, you know, everybody does their job. All the guys in a fab shop, you know, building the cars, and we've got real nice cars. And them guys don't get a whole lot of credit, but they do a whole lot of work. So how did a team that was used to winning so often deal with the summer dry spell? When they have a problem, they live it with me. So any one of those guys at the shop, if they ever need anything, they can always rest assured that when they come to me, Rusty helps them, and I'll be happy to do that. And, and they know it's a big team effort, and so my team is perfect. My morale is sky high and the real understanding. When you're sitting out there and we're flying along and we got a half a lap lead on the field, and they're all looking at the calculator and they all know we got a pit for fuel and they all know we're going to not make it, we all live and die together. But we can go home knowing that our performance was real high. When the performance is low and you're running bad, buddy, that's bad. Statistically, the team is behind compared to recent years, but still Rusty ranks third in top fives, tied with Terry Labonte with 11. And heading into North Wilkesboro, he's one of only seven drivers with two or more wins. We're, we're always there. We always got a shot at it, and sometimes we shoot ourselves in the foot. But, I, you know, I, this has been a good year for us. And I, it's not over with it. Mm -hmm. I think that towards the end of the year, you're going to see us win a couple of more races, and then we'll, we'll just concentrate on beating the heck out of them next year. What does Rusty think of the rules which have been massaged by NASCAR throughout the year to even up the Chevy and the Fords? We definitely got the shaft early in the year with the, with the cars, with the Chevrolet thing, but now it's a lot, lot closer. It's much closer. And it's so close now that it's not even worth complaining about or voicing an opinion about to try to stick up for your rights because you got to do it. I mean, Richard Childress is down there just screaming like hell that the Fords are too good, and I'm down there screaming like hell that the, the Chevrolets are too good. And we get done screaming, we just put our arms around each other. He's, he's a good guy. He fights for his rights, and I'm fighting for my rights. If the crew chief's bad, you fire him. If the driver's bad, you fire him. If the tire guys aren't doing right, you, you fire him. Or, or the pit crew is not doing right, you make changes there. When it comes to these, uh, these big-time issues, you, you're stuck with it, you know? And uh, you try to work with the manufacturer if, if that's the problem, to make it better. You know, it's hard to, it's hard to fire Edsel Ford. <laughs> so Ford will be tweaking its T-Bird for 1996, and Rusty hopes he will take one to the title. And if he does, it will be an accomplishment shared among the team. And no one knows more than Rusty that it takes good individuals, and it takes good individuals that work together. You go, you get this interview done, you go interview any of those guys, and you ask them what they think of that Penske team, you think of me, and... I'd be surprised if anything, anybody had anything bad to say because, I mean, you know, we took a lot of heat because I took them all on the cruise last year. We went on a cruise and we weren't doing good early, so that's because you guys screwed off and went on a cruise while we were working. <laughs> that was a bunch of baloney. But we look after our people 
Yeah, we love them. They're good boys. They, they work hard for me, and they, and, they, and they live and die with me, and that's, that, that's neat. Today's mailbox is brought to you by Miller Genuine Draft. Our question comes from Oren Conant of Ripon, Wisconsin. Two common causes for engine failure are burn pistons and dropped valves. Would you please explain the exact meaning of these two terms? Hi, I'm Mark Cronkins with Hendricks Motorsports, the tune-up man for the 18 car Interstate Battery Chevrolet. Uh, burn piston is actually when the piston actually disintegrates in the cylinder wall. There, the rings are gone, the top of the piston's over half gone, and it just that's what we consider a burn piston. Actually, the fire actually blows it apart. And a drop valve is the head of the valve falls off of the stem of the valve and drops in the cylinder wall and bounces around in there and destroys the motor that way. Thanks for your question. If you have any race questions, write to us at Inside Winston Cup Racing, Box 240-417, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28224. If we use your question on the air, you'll receive this embroidered Miller Genuine Draft jacket. Meet John Boy and Billy, NASCAR's resident wise guys. These radio personalities have been keeping race teams and race fans laughing for years. Now you can order their entertaining four-tape collection by calling 1-800-471-STUFF. Call now 1-800-471-STUFF and hear for yourself. Next week, the Winston Cup Series returns to the Charlotte Motor Speedway for the UAW GM500. Expect plenty of news on and off the track. We'll have complete coverage from the Charlotte Motor Speedway next Sunday. Hi, I'm Darrell Waltrip, driver of the Western Auto Chevrolet. And you know, I don't think I've missed any of the Inside Winston Cup racing shows since they've been on the air for the last 10 years. Just want to wish them a happy 10th and many, many more returns. <laughs> One of the highlights of the AC Delco 400 weekend here at the North Carolina Motor Speedway is the annual Unical World Pit Crew Competition. The Ray Evernham, Jeff Gordon crew won it last year. Of course, they'll be back to defend their title this year. And TNN always covers that competition for you. This week, the Speedway held a day for the media, including our IWCR crew, to see what it's like to make one of those fast pit stops. The excitement for the 1995 Unical World Pit Crew Championship was turned up on Tuesday when the North Carolina Motor Speedway offered a chance at 15 seconds of fame, a pit stop competition among various members of the media. The reigning World Pit Crew Champions from the DuPont team served as coaches for five crews, all under tremendous peer pressure to perform. Our coach was Jackman Dave Denning. Basically, you want your arm against the tire, right. you'll rotate just like that. All right, go clockwise. Okay. Everyone was poised to perform, because in addition to pride, some nice prizes were on the line. If you took a look at those plaques, uh, there's some incentive to win. That's a nice size plaque there. Got the lug nuts on it, just like the actual pit competition trophy does. So it, it's a coveted prize, to say the least. And our team coach is, is a pretty big guy, so if a fight breaks out, we've got an advantage there too, don't you think? Right, that's what we try to go with with our pit crew. We try to go with weight. We want the, the, the heaviest team, so if there's ever a problem, Jeff ever gets into a scuffle or something, we can back him up. After the real guys showed us how it's supposed to be done, it was time for practice. We watched the competition intently. Okay. Now go ahead and try and pull it off. Okay. It will be all right. She'll push a little bit further. It'll be right on. She'll start hitting the lug nuts. Just like we just did. Well, maybe, but just to be on the safe side, our crew tried to show its appreciation in advance of the competition. Inside Winston Cup. <laughs> <laughs> then the five-team event got underway. One loose lug nut in the rear. 46-56. Woo! Hey! Way to go, way to go, good job. 26-28. Finally, we lined up our team, led by Ned as crew chief. Randy and editor Scott Dallas were our tire changers. I took the role of gas man. Harry Kogan was one tire carrier. Pam Branner was our catch cam person. Pat Berger was our second tire carrier. And Kim Novak documented the stop on videotape that was later destroyed. 35-50. Your critique. You did well for the first time. 
The only thing you need to do is be slower and smoother, which will give you faster time. Yeah, it's not as easy as it looks on TV, is it? Definitely not. Definitely not. You have to work hard at it, hard and steady. Will you still acknowledge us when we pass in the Winston Cup garage? Oh, by far. By far. Terrific. I will feel offended if you don't come up. Terrific. Thank you, Super. Hey, enjoyed it. Definitely enjoyed it. I guess that didn't look too bad on TV, but the next time you see one of our guys at the racetrack, ask them about the outtakes. I guess they better not give up their day job. Well, our time's up for today. Hope you enjoyed the show. We're off to Charlotte. Maybe we'll see you there. Join us again here on TNN for more on Inside Winston Cup Racing. Today's show has been brought to you by Texaco Clean System 3 Gasolines. Add more life to your car. Cold-filtered Miller Genuine Draft, making the world a very cool place. And by Goodyear, number one in racing, number one in tires. Team Simpson is your ticket to be part of all the exciting racing action. Call 1-800-71-RACING to order the 1995 catalog and join Team Simpson today. The official conversion van of Inside Winston Cup Racing is Gladiator by Glavelle. America's number one luxury van, Glavelle. The way we put it together sets us apart.